get this up and then share it. Do, 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 do. Hmm. So are you looking at a, a document? Yes. Yep. Oh, good. Very good. All right. Well, seven o'clock, let's start. Um, for those of you that I don't know, um, Bob Hoffman, I am the old guy in pediatric ophthalmology, source of most blame. And the uh, uh, purpose of this talk is basically to, for the new folks, acquaint you with what is um, across the bridge, you know, at primary and not necessarily as much, you know, about what's going to happen when you rotate with us because that'll become readily apparent and you'll get additional documents about that. But as you take call, as you're asked <coughs> to do consults, you need to know where things are. Uh, one of the things that I asked uh, Elaine to get out as far as a kind of a homework assignment before this was to make sure all of you had had a tour of primary uh, uh, to include the highlights that you need to know about in terms of functioning, which would include our clinic, um, the ER, ICUs, NICU, patient wards, um, places where you can get free food, um, mainly places where you can get free food, um, and how to get in and out, um, you do all need you know, badges. If you don't have badges, uh, you're gonna be in big trouble um, in terms of getting into things. I mean, if you're really stuck, you can always call security at primary. Um, useful to know the, the number to reach the operator and get security if you're just grabbing a phone somewhere is 801-662-1000 uh, uh, from outside and they can find security, they can meet you somewhere, and as long as you have some ID and a badge and a reasonable story, they'll let you in. Um, we have three different locations, uh, only uh, uh, one of which uh, you're responsible to cover as far as on call and consults. When you are on the service with us, you may be sent to Riverton or Farmington for clinic, and uh, that, again, you'll learn about at the time in terms of getting directions to get there, but you definitely do not need to go to any other hospitals uh, uh, other than University Hospital and Primary uh, to see children, infants, or neonates. Um, you know, right now, there are five members of our uh, division, myself, Dave Vries, Mary L. Young, Mimi, um, Leah Owen, and Griffin Jardine. Uh, we also have a wonderful orthoptist, Julie Harmon, and when you come over to spend time with us, she will be a major asset in terms of uh, giving you uh, insight into ocular motility. You'll learn to do ROP exams uh, hands-on at both of you in primary. Um, who's on consults now? That's Sean Collin. Okay, not on the not on the on the uh, 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 session yet. Uh, no, he's on the session. Oh, okay. Yep. Any issues as far as call at this point, Sean? I guess not. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, I, again, as far as getting into primary, you know, with COVID issues. Basically, wash your hands when you come across the bridge. Let yourself in uh, because nobody's guarding the gate on the fourth floor anymore. Uh, so it's no longer an issue of being interrogated, uh, you know, having your family history checked and your temperature and, and whatnot. Um, if you do get calls, you know, when you're on consults from outside, um, feel free to talk to the resident on our service, to one of the pediatric ophthalmologists or if it's after hours to your attending, on-call attending, uh, to see you know, what, what to do with that. We basically take pretty much anybody, anybody wants to send to us, but we probably should talk about it before we accept the transfer. Um, as far as one other thing to make uh, you aware of, and 
Um, I know, Catherine, you've not been down to American Fork yet. I, I think that, uh, um, is that right? Mm, no, I haven't been. I'm haven't going been. next okay. I'm going next Monday. Next Monday. Okay, very good. You know, the American Fork Training School, for those of you who don't know, is basically a place where severely uh, 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 developmentally impaired children were once uh, um, housed and uh, as a residential school and a facility uh, for them, uh, hence the name school. And the idea was to try to train them to go out and do something in society. Um, and it kind of evolved into a place where unplaceable adults with severe developmental uh, disabilities reside. Um, and we do provide uh, their eye care. Uh, and that means you provide it. Um, you do get some reimbursement for it in the form of credit at the bookstore um, that I arranged to have that passed on to you because I was um, had my arm twisted into taking that over uh, when the, you'd, you, the word school was used implying children, uh, unfortunately, there are no children there. Um, but if you do have issues there, uh, let me know. And otherwise, I think it's a good opportunity uh, to work a bit independently. Any surgery that comes out of there that you're capable of doing, you should do. Arrange and attending uh, and, and go for it. And I think you'll find the staff out there is very helpful. Now, uh, as far as uh, service coverage, kind of going through this document, and again, this should have gotten to you to review ahead of time. And if anybody has questions, concerns, or anyone who's been there has comments, jump in. Um, as far as consults during the day now, we do have a first year resident PGY2 uh, responsible for consults. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful that you're doing those. Realize that I, I think it's certainly early on important to run almost all, if not all of those consults by an attending, often convenient to do that, run it by the attending who is in clinic and just stop in. We'll talk in between patients and we can figure out whatever uh, uh, you know, issues uh, have arisen. Um, in the ER, uh, again, during the day, it's gonna be the consult resident, after hours, the on-call resident. Um, we have, uh, all sorts of instruments that you are welcome to use in our clinic, um, but please realize that they come back to clinics or they're there when you want them next. Um, please take care of that portable slit lamp. Um, when it drops on the floor, it does not bounce well, and that has happened, and it takes a while to get the darn thing fixed. Um, if you've not been through our clinic uh, to know where the instruments live that you can borrow, uh, grab a more senior resident and, and, and do that. It's useful to know where to get things and also where to put them so they're clean and ready to go the next time. Um, if there are issues that come up either consult-wise because one of our post-ops has become an inpatient or after hours, feel free to call the attending involved, call the resident on the service. Um, and realize you may wind up in some political issues with people trying, you know, because there is at times some overlap in some of our services, particularly with oculoplastics um, in terms of who's fixing orbital fractures and things of that sort, even eyelid lacerations. Um, but I think that we need to be committed to doing what's best for patients, which basically amounts to saying that, you know, if, we need to look at the patient's eyes and ENT is going to fix the uh, floor fractures and we can all work together and get the patient taken care of. Why not? Um, and you may find that ENT may invite you to go to the OR with them to see how they fix, you know, fractures or do what they're doing and uh, feel free to do that. Um, the issue of uh, uh, abusive head trauma, non-accidental trauma, you will get called. Um, and uh, for most of, of you, this is a review but um, when you see those patients, you want to make sure first that it is okay to dilate their pupils. Um, often these kids have significant intracranial injuries and the gatekeeper for that dilation is going to be the neurosurgery service. So when someone calls you, it's always good to ask, can I dilate the patient? Please check with neurosurgery. Uh, you know, if they're on their service, 
um, because you may have a general pediatrics, uh, you know, intern calling you or the intern that has been assigned in the PICU. And we want to make sure neurosurgery is okay with us dilating the patient if they're using those pupils to follow the patient's neurologic status. Um, once you've done that, any patient who has retinal hemorrhages needs to be seen by somebody more senior than you, kind of as a mantra, um, mainly because we need to be able to provide a little bit of input as to what it means. Secondly, if something goes to court, I want that burden of having to sort this out and go to court to fall on me or one of my peds colleagues, not on you. And if we haven't seen the patient, it probably will fall on you. Now, we like to get photographs and OCT when possible on almost all of these kids. If they've got hemorrhages um, and um, it can wait until tomorrow, it's a weekday, because these things often get asked you know, to, for a look-see at night. Um, we have things set up through photography. Uh, Mel has now moved on, but Glenn uh, is probably ground central and Mel can still help with this. Mel's currently our ROP coordinator. She's no longer a, a photographer in photography. Um, but they will come to bedside with you and take photographs. Um, and if there are circumacular folds, do OCT. Um, and if you are not uh, yet clear on what a circumacular fold is, we're going to look at them in just a bit. Um, find someone more senior and get a look with. Uh, but you're welcome to call me at any point about these NAT kids. I've always got my cell phone, and I'm happy to talk to you and lend helpful advice about what direction we should go in. Um, and so my pager home phone cell. I mean, the pager just goes to my cell phone now. The pager doesn't physically exist anymore, but you're welcome to call me. Now, as far as rotations, I mentioned consult rotation first year. Second year, you spend three months with uh, uh, four residents, three, three months on our service uh, full-time, and you're welcome to come back uh, if uh, you're interested uh, for an elective in the third year, um, if you didn't get enough of us, or you just uh, want to uh, do something different. Um, and we're happy to work out individual experiences either here or possibly on an international elective. Um, as far as the clinic experience, you'll learn history and exam skills, um, make a note in EPIC, um, and I want you to commit yourself to what you think in EPIC. I think that's a useful exercise, but you're going to develop skills in vision assessment in kids, motility measurements, refraction, and, and I, you know, I expect you to be able to do good retinoscopy when you get done, um, and to do anterior segment fundus exams, even in neonates, you know, at bedside. Um, use that information to come up with a, a differential diagnosis and a plan, and then um, also good to gain some uh, understanding in the interaction between our services, other services at Moran, like pediatric retina, glaucoma, um, and uh, uh, be able to uh, interact with those folks. Also, other pediatric specialties and support services, like the parent infant program and early intervention. Um, now, as far as surgical experience, again, if you have the opportunity to come to the OR with us ahead of time, have some loops. If you don't have loops, I do have one set uh, that you can use. It's in a headset thing, and it's there for that purpose. Um, and uh, use that to do practice surgery. If you want to borrow it, just let me know, and I'll make those arrangements. Um, and then as far as reading uh, materials, um, there are a number of texts in the library. Uh, there also are texts on the bookshelf in my office at Moran. And during normal times, uh, Laura Power, my assistant, uh, can let you into my office. Uh, Darcy, who sits next to her, into that actually here and not at home because it's hard for Laura to unlock it remotely, um, can let you in. She has a key, and you're welcome to sit there to your heart's content. Yes, it's a mess, but there are a lot of books, and make yourself at home and, and read. Um, as far as my recommendations about what you do, you know, just in general, not necessarily just for peds, but as a resident, uh, an hour a day of reading on general ophthalmology issues, an hour a day on whatever subspecialty you're in, and then read about at least one or two interesting patients that you've seen every single day. 
And any day you don't do that, you're behind. Um, now, as far as, you know, your ID, if any of you have trouble getting an ID or getting access, let me know. Uh, I would get a hold of medical records at primary if you have not already and get a dictation number. And that way, when you operate with someone, that dictation will get back to you. I'll have your number. Um, and if you dictate, it'll get back to you. Um, and make sure you have access to iCentra as well as Epic. And again, if you don't, give me a call. Give Catherine a call. She's on the service now, and she can help arrange that. Um, now, for those of you who've spent time on PEDS and spent a lot of time doing consults and things, seeing things, what insights do you have to share with your junior colleagues? Um, I would say with pediatric examinations, just be very patient. Um, and then I think the hardest part in your guys' shoes is just getting used to examining kids. Other comments, concerns? For the new people, have you had any issues that have come up at primary that I can be of help with at this point? I've actually been... Uh, maybe I've just been fortunate, but I've been kind of pleasantly surprised by um, how easy some, a lot of the kids have been to examine. Uh, if, if, if you just do kind of what Catherine was saying, um, especially down in the ED. Um, and I haven't run into any problems. Everyone's been really helpful. Yeah. Catherine has offered to uh, come see patients with me when she's in clinic. And that's been super helpful as well. So I've been trying to take advantage of that. You know, a couple of things, Sean, good kind of segue, and I'm glad you made those comments. Um, it sometimes, you know, comes up that you, you really, you know, for me, the issue at times is what is it I need to see in a kid? And can I see it with them awake? Can I hold them still and get it done? Or, you know, do they need a bit of sedation? And, and often in the ER, the child's frightened. They've been there for hours. They're starving. They're angry. And they don't want anything to do with you. And so it, it, very appropriately may be the case that you need to sedate them to get a good look to make sure that they don't have some intraocular injury when they've had a penetrating eyelid injury or something of that sort. And when the situation comes up that you're going to sedate the child, particularly for the very junior residents, my strong recommendation is when you make that decision that, gee, I think I need to sedate this kid, I would do two things. I would run that decision by somebody more senior, more senior resident probably, to make sure that they don't think they could get a look, at which point then you've saved the patient the sedation. And then the other thing is that if there is anyone you think needs to be there when the child is sedated, so they don't want it being sedated twice, call them, get them there, coordinate it, probably results in better patient care, and it may result in a better learning opportunity for you. Um, the other corollary with that is that you may well be called either on consults or on call by one of the NICUs. And if it's a question about, gee, so-and-so didn't get an exam yesterday when they were there doing ROP exams, we're sending them home tomorrow. We want you to come right now tonight to do an ROP exam. I'm not entirely comfortable with putting that responsibility on you guys, I think that that is a decision that needs to be made in an attending level, maybe a fellow level, but definitely not, I don't think a resident level, because there are huge medical legal implications if we say one thing about ROP and the patient has a bad outcome and they went home with our blessing. Um, and I'd rather that that decision, and it may be that it happens anyway, sits on one of our shoulders and not your shoulders, so that I think the thing I would urge you to do if you get that call is pass that on to one of the pediatric ophthalmologists. And again, you're welcome to call me um, during the day. You can certainly call Catherine and she'll help you sort out what to do. But realize I do not expect you to do after hours ROP exams or take, again, take the whole hit and the responsibility in terms of the abuse of head trauma kids. Uh, we need to be involved in that. It's kind of our job to provide backup and teaching with that. Um, what other issues have come up at primary? The, 
one thing I want to make you all aware of. Now, who here on the call has been called to the ER at primary to close a lid laceration that you have gone ahead and closed yourself in the ER? Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. The one thing I want to make you aware of is, and I don't know that you all are aware of it, um, but there was an issue about six weeks ago, maybe a little longer, um, where our kit that uh, was put together to, you know, for lid lacerations in the ER, so you'd have everything you needed to take over there, was used. Unfortunately, there were latex containing gloves in it, and a nurse in the ER was exposed to those latex containing gloves and had a very serious reaction to latex. Um, and so, um, I'm, Catherine, I'm gonna be asking you to talk to your colleagues here at some point. We need to come up with some instruments that we wanna have and maybe just the instruments out of the set if you're happy with that, but we're gonna wanna leave everything else but the instruments out of the set and then I need a list of all of that from someone because I need to go to the ER and present that to them so they can put that together. Uh, their end of the deal is if we're gonna change that situation, my expectation is they'll have every last thing that you need together so that they can have that there so it's still seamless for you, but we're using their supplies and we just have our instruments. Uh, we can also ask them to get some instruments um, probably mm -hmm. time at least to rethink this. And um, Catherine, if you wouldn't mind taking the, the lead on that and then sorting through that. I know that the latex gloves were pulled out of our sets, our, our, our kit to do that, but we, may, we need to kind of look at the rest of that stuff as well. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, think we, that, go ahead. Yeah, I think Chris Bear uh, had emailed all of us to make sure that we don't use latex gloves anymore. Um, but yeah, I can, I can, we can um, look at the list of instruments in there. We have a list actually already, so I yeah. can send that to you. If you get the list to me, you know, I am absolutely in complete agreement that it's great to have our own set of stuff to take over there. I think that the ER is feeling a little bit uncomfortable after that in terms of the supplies. They want to know that the supplies are sterile and all that stuff. And um, I, I don't have a, uh, a, a huge issue with that, as long as it isn't a matter of you having to wait endlessly for someone to round up supplies. I expect them to be already collected, you know, in a, 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 a kit or something for you to be able to use so that you don't have to wait. So that this is also probably a time to just to rethink that kit to see if you all want to change anything. Now, I want to, as far as, um, I think that's it in terms of this topic, but I've got one other and I need to see now if I pull this up, if I can close this, unless we have more questions about that. And then I want to bring this up. And are you seeing a PowerPoint presentation now? Yes, you yes. can see Yes. Oh, good. Well, let's, and I think if I did that right, this should work. This is brief and I'm sandbagging you with this because this wasn't on the homework list. But the book that I mentioned, that non-accidental trauma book, is in our clinic, it's in the library, and it's on my bookshelf. There are two chapters in there that are definitely worth taking a look at, mainly for the photos in it, because the photos are good. I must say I did take most of them, um, but um, that book was written mainly for attorneys to use when they're trying to... Um, either prosecute or defend uh, 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 perpetrators or, or prosecute them. And so uh, that was the orientation of it. And I wrote the I stuff in it. Um, and it's not entirely dated. There isn't good OCT information in there because people were not using OCT. And we'll talk about that. But um, abusive head trauma um, is one of my clinical interests. And I've been involved in it by default because People keep shaking their children and uh, they keep coming from this part of the country to primary. Um, you know, vitreous hemorrhages and intracranial bleeding were described by Tursen back in 1900 and Caffey, uh, who's a pediatrician in the 1940s described this combination of subdural hematoma and, and fractures. Um, 
that were an indication in his mind of child abuse. In the 70s, the term shaken baby syndrome was coined. And then recently, that has fallen by the wayside. The term abusive head trauma has uh, been used. And this affects a lot of kids. Um, and your findings and evaluation, when you see these kids, uh, are, are, are important. And they may well be used both in patient care and in medical you know, legal proceedings. Um, and somewhere up to you know, 80% of kids that have known uh, shaking have hemorrhages. And the hemorrhages have consequences. Realize your, your examination and everything you write down or put in EPIC or ICENTRA may wind up being something you get to discuss with attorneys in front of a court reporter or in front of a judge. And I would approach it that way. Um, and we have an obligation to communicate those findings to those that need to know, which would include the care team at the hospital, family, and law enforcement. And then this part of it often gets left out of these discussions, and that is these kids have ongoing problems, we'll touch on briefly, uh, with changes in retina, changes in brain uh, vision pathways uh, that may require support, may never get better. Um, when you see retinal hemorrhages, there's nothing that makes a given child, there's nothing that just says this is child abuse, but there are certain circumstances where it's a lot more suggestive than others. And if you've got hemorrhages that are in multiple layers, they are throughout the retina, that is highly suggestive. And there are, you know, there are perimeter folds, these little folds, outer area away from the fovea around the edge of the macula and retinoschisis, splitting the retinal layers, big bullous changes in the, the uh, uh, macular area. Those are an indication that there's been likely some acceleration, deceleration injury with substances that are different moving against each other. The current thinking about perimacular folds is that the vitreous is tacked down in that area and over retinal blood vessels. And that has to do with why you develop both the folds and the schesis changes. Now, if we were to look at this patient, um, I need a volunteer. Describe what you see in this picture. Which eye is it? What are we looking at? Volunteer. Uh, so it's a fundus photo of the right eye. Yep. Showing um, retinal hemorrhages in all four quadrants in all three layers of the retina, um, including in the fovea. Um, don't see evidence of perimacular folds or schesis, but maybe hard to see. The optic okay. nerve is largely obscured. It is, uh, although when you look, I looked at that, and if you magnify it, I'm not convinced that optic nerve is swollen. Um, there's retinal edema, you know, that makes it hard. When mm -hmm. you look at the, just temporal to the optic nerve, there's a lot of swelling in the retina. But when you look at this, and then if you carefully, you know, depress the patient and you look out, you would see hemorrhages all the way out to the aura serrata. You know, so this is the kind of patient where this is highly suggestive of abusive head trauma. And I carefully choose the wording I put in these darn consults, you know, where it could be compatible with to highly suggestive. Um, you can't say it, it's diagnostic of because there are no changes that are like that. But where you've got multi-layered hemorrhages that extend throughout the retina, that is a different kettle of fish than the patient who comes in that has, you know, superficial hemorrhages mainly around the optic nerve and in the posterior pole. Now, what would that be more compatible with? If you had just superficial hemorrhages, so not multi-layered, just around the optic nerve, what would you think in a child the most likely scenario would be? How about increased intracranial pressure? And that's probably the most common culprit. So this would be the child who's got sudden shunt dysfunction. Their pressure goes way up. Those kids will wind up with a few hemorrhages around the optic nerve. The child who has direct blunt head trauma has uh, um, you know, an intracranial bleed, a subdural that's limited, um, that and increased intracranial pressure, that child 
you know, you may see they've got bilateral six nerve palsies from the increased pressure. Um, but, and, and so that child, I would still say it could be compatible with abusive head trauma. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, you have to be less strong about it. And I think we have an obligation to maintain equipoise in reporting these changes. That's good. Good description, Marshall. That was very good. And uh, let's see what else. Now, this patient, what do we see? You know, if you looked at, let's go back to that previous one. If I were to ask, am I worried about the patient's vision at this point? Is what's going on here interfering with the patient's vision? Is it, you know, absolutely, yes. possibly, or not at all? Uh, almost certainly, since there's almost. stuff that's scaring the phobia. It looks like pure yeah. retinal. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I think that that's the case. And here, you'll see even more in this left eye. What do you see, you know, in the, in the posterior pole there? It's much, much larger hemorrhage, isn't it? In that left eye. Um, you know, in the macular area and more confluent pre-retinal hemorrhage there. Um, and that definitely will block vision. My point here being that not only do we need to think about what's going on and what the implications of it, but I kind of go through a little bit of a checklist in my own mind when I see these kids and say, how worried am I about this child's vision? I mean, if these hemorrhages don't clear, um, I may need Emmy to go in and, you know, and do something because often hemorrhages like this one here in the, this hemorrhage, this, if this is pre-retinal, if it breaks through uh, uh, into the vitreous, you wind up with a large vitreous hemorrhage in front of the fovea um, that can interfere with, uh, you know, vision development uh, in an infant or a toddler. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, Another patient, again, this is actually, this is the same patient, different view. And now what are we seeing here? What is this thing, you know, like the positive arrow sign, what is this? That is a circummacular fold. This is the optic nerve, fovea is down here. The picture is a bit rotated, mainly because the photographer, that would be me, didn't have the camera oriented appropriately. Um, but this shows that fold, um, and it's very striking when you see it. And it, again, is something that really raises um, suspicion of acceleration, deceleration forces with the head, which is the currently uh, um, presumed mechanism. Um, and you all need to realize that most of what we know about abusive head trauma comes from perpetrators confessing and putting that together with those exams, and then looking at series of accidental head trauma, there are not wonderful studies looking at the mechanisms of this. Now, Brittany Coates, who is um, uh, you know, professor down in um, engineer, the engineering department, she's a mechanical engineer, she um, has done, is doing elegant studies to look at this, but you know, we still don't have a good explanation that fits with what we think is going on clinically. So our thinking about this in your practice careers may be changed by, you know, folks like Dr. Coates and her modeling. Um, and she's trying to work this out, but it's, it turns out that modeling what is actually going on in the eye is proving to be quite difficult. Another fold in this right eye close up. Now, what about the sequelae? And, and this is where, you know, make sure these kids get in for follow-up. And, you know, the, what I talk to the parents about issues in these kids, I like to surprise them a bit with the idea that, you know, may mean that your child was shaken and, and observe their reaction to it. Um, and I have had the experience on multiple occasions where after I've had that discussion, they, the perpetrator decides to fess up to whoever is seeing them from safe and healthy families. Uh, but that's not the, the major purpose of my telling is just to describe what the findings are and to let them know that follow-up is essential. I ask them where they live and see if we need to, you know, to get them to see somebody 
in Montana or Nevada or wherever they've come from if it isn't local. Uh, but central vision loss due to changes in brain uh, tissues, optic atrophy, either associated with increased intracranial pressure or just due to direct injury to tissues uh, is uh, very common. And subretinal neovascular membrane formation is not as well recognized, but does happen. Now, what do you see in this picture with the positive arrow sign? Somebody tell me what they see here. Is that a normal nerve? No, I'm not quite sure what the arrow sign is indicating, but well, the, the nerve looks very pallorous and it has also like a, almost like a ring or uh, like atrophy around it. Yeah, the, the atrophy, uh, that ring may have been there and may be normal, but that nerve mm -hmm. is clearly pale. You know, axons have left, and, 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 and the purpose in showing this is that you may see kids in clinic and the history may not be clear, they may have been hospitalized for a head injury, and the retinal hemorrhages can disappear quickly. There are some studies now that suggest that a lot of hemorrhages may disappear in some of these kids, even in 24 hours. So the point being that you may be left with a situation where you don't have hemorrhages to look at. You've got a pale nerve, you're trying to put things together and decide what happened, and this is not an infrequent sequelae. Now, there are ERG changes. You'll see um, changes like retinoschesis with loss of the B wave on ERG um, that may help you sort things out. Um, OCT may show thinning of the uh, nerve fiber layer around the nerve. Um, and you may wind up with changes like this. Now, somebody tell me what they see in this picture. What do you describe what you see? Don't leave it all on Catherine. She's picking up the weight here. <laughs> I'll give it a go. <laughs> sure. um, so photo of the right eye. Yeah. Um, the central area, particularly around the macula, appears, well, it appears that the um, vessels are elevated. Um, there's also kind of a gray coloring to it. I don't know if it's indicative of edema or... Right. No, that's, that's a good description and could be edema, uh, could be a mass. Um, to give you some background, I met this young fellow when he was six months old. Um, he was sedated, intubated in the PICU at primary in the old children's hospital. And he had confluent retinal edema, multilayered retinal hemorrhages from optic nerve to aura serrata. And had uh, significant intracranial you know, hemorrhages. And um, they had called me to come see him because they did not think he was gonna survive. And so I got one of those phone calls saying, we need you to come to the PICU now because this child may not make it and we want to have your exam and we want photographs taken. And so these photographs were taken later with a Zeiss fundus camera, but the photographs I initially took at bedside were with a handheld Kawa film camera through a 20 diopter lens documenting those hemorrhages. And I followed this child and this picture was taken when he was a teenager and he has huge bilateral subretinal nevascular membranes. And Mike Teske and I went back and forth about options. You know, there's no way to laser any of this without destroying his central vision, his best vision has been stable at about 2200. Um, and I followed this kid till he was grown. I was invited both to his high school graduation and to his wedding. Um, and, um, you know, followed he and his family. And um, the perpetrator was never sorted out in that circumstance. Nobody ever fessed up and they were not able to make an arrest. But clear in my mind that this child had been shaken by someone. Um, probably someone very close to him, but subretinal nevascular membranes uh, um, are, you know, occasionally occur, and and these have remained stable, and he's followed, you know, by a retina doc now yearly. Um, this is the other eye um, with similar changes, and so um, 
Mike, Dr. Teske recommended that we simply follow him regularly. He didn't think that doing anything surgically was going to help. Um, and lastly, with this, you know, our ocular findings alone, pathognomonic of abusive head trauma, and the answer to that in my mind is absolutely not. And the way, you know, what I tell people when they say, well, you know, is it pathognomonic? No. On the other hand, if you've got confluent hemorrhages, multi-layer that extend from optic nerve to aura serrata, and you don't have a history of either a fall, like this time of year through an open window onto concrete, you know, from a, at least two stories, or the child was an unrestrained missile in a 60 mile an hour head on car crash, then it's highly suggestive that they were shaken and somebody needs to sort that out. You know, one of the questions that should be in your mind is, well, are there accidental head injuries that have been reported with findings that look just like what we think are very, very suggestive? Yeah, the reason we put that caveat in there, there's a case that every attorney that defends, you know, accused perpetrators knows, and it's a child, it was a toddler um, who climbed up onto a TV console and pulled a huge TV set back on top of him, crushing his head, killing him, and causing changes that at autopsy looked just like what we describe in abusive head trauma. So that if you pull a very large television set over and you crush your head, um, you can duplicate these findings, but it requires horrific head trauma and there are kids, again, with massive accidental head trauma that have had changes that are suggestive. And you're all aware, I think, at this point and should read about all of the various things. Um, and they're listed in that, uh, those two chapters uh, um, referenced uh, about all the different things in the different differential diagnosis, like, you know, glutaric acid urea type 2 and various things that we don't think of a lot in ophthalmology that get looked at in, in the workup. Um, there's some other things like, gee, I had bad retinopathy prematurity and somebody bumped my head and I had a, a you know, retinal hemorrhage. Those things do happen and it's our job to sort those out. Um, I, I kind of see our role as trying to be a good advocate for the uh, patient and at times the family in terms of sorting this stuff out. Now, how many of you have seen kids with changes that we have described as being highly suggestive of abusive head trauma at this point in your careers? I have. You I have know that, one? yeah, other people in my class have. Everybody in your, your class have for the, the, now the first year residents, have you um, had that experience? When I was on buddy call, yes. Okay. And you wanna- I have not. Okay. You know, and, and, and it'll happen and um, it'll bother you. Um, you know, I still remember the very first child I saw with abusive head trauma, uh, mainly because um, I did stick my neck out and say I thought it was child abuse. And the kid's dad came through the University of uh, Michigan Mott Children's Hospital ICU, came through the front door with a gun looking for me. Um, and security and the nurses booted me out the back. Um, and the guy had basically killed his child um, because I was seeing the child for the first time just prior to his becoming a multiple organ donor. Um, and um, dad had shaken him and had crushed, crushed a couple of vertebrae, pushing the child and grinding him against a chair. Um, and it was pathetic. Um, but I still remember that kid, mainly because my son was the same age. So that all you know hits close to home, and if it affects you and you're really bothered by it, I mean, feel free to call me and we'll talk about it because um, it is real. And um, you know, uh, at least one person that you know well, I won't mention by name, um, but when she was a resident in our program, I mean, had one that was again the same age as one of her kids, and it hits close to home. Um, 
concerns or issues or things with our approach in terms of this abusive head trauma issue that we need to talk about? Because this would be a good time to, to go through them if there are. Um, I think the only thing, Dr. Hoffman, is that uh, we've been told by chiefs of previous years and kind of like that our policy is that we don't see these kiddos specifically for looking for retinal hemorrhages. One, uh, of course, if they're not cleared for a dilated exam yet, or two, if Safe and Healthy Families has not specifically requested these exams. Um, well, also, like you said, for liability and safety reasons so from our end. I think you're right. I think that, and that is a, is a great point, Catherine, to bring up. The issue that she's bringing up, uh, just to, to clarify it, is the issue of being asked to take a look undilated at the kids and then render a definitive opinion about whether there are A, retinal hemorrhages, and B, are they suggestive of abusive head trauma? And while I think it's very likely that you can get a look and say there are hemorrhages present or I don't see hemorrhages, it doesn't mean that there aren't hemorrhages to be found. You just can't see them undilated. And things may look quite different when you actually get to look dilated. And we don't want to set all those wheels in motion based on an inadequate exam. So I think I agree with you 100%. I think that from my perspective, that still holds that we don't want to examine those kids until we can dilate them, unless there is some very compelling reason to do so. And when that is the case, I think you have to state, if you're looking undilated, that this is an undilated exam. It really isn't adequate, but it's being done under extenuating circumstances and limit the, you know, the, the findings to, I saw retinal hemorrhages, there are retinal hemorrhages present, um, or I didn't see retinal hemorrhages. And with the hemorrhages, you know, I, I, when I'm asked to do that, I just make a note to say that um, I can't say the extent, you know, I can't really determine the extent of them until we can do a dilated exam. For background on that, the reason that this was brought up as an issue of seeing them urgently, even if neurosurgery doesn't want them dilated, is that there are reports in the child abuse literature of hemorrhages changing fairly dramatically in the first 24 to 48 hours, you know, after injury. They can start to resolve. And, um, and so I think that if we can convince neurosurgery to do that, and at our institution, you know, that has, we've had one very conservative neurosurgeon, he also turns out to be the guy in charge, um, who um, has been reluctant to let us dilate pupils as early as either safe and healthy families or ophthalmology obviously would like to. And being that they're the ones that are taking care of the kid's brains, and if the kid does start to herniate, they're going to have to deal with it. I have to still defer to their uh, decision making. You know, in my practice career, I have seen kids herniate while dilated, um, <clears throat> and it's not been a good experience. And I've also had a number of kids get urgent neuroimaging tests when a nurse suddenly discovered at 3 a.m that a child's pupils were as big as dinner plates um, and then find out that it was due to an eye exam, you know, on, on the day before. So I think that uh, we need to work together, you know, with the nursing staff, make sure when we dilate pupils, we have a sign put up <clears throat> so that when they're making uh, their rounds, if they do actually look at the pupils, uh, that they're not surprised to suddenly find dilated pupils after we've done an exam and dilated them pharmacologically. Does that help with your observation, Catherine? Because I think that that's, you know, that, that is an important issue you brought up. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And, and, you know, and if you're in doubt and you're really getting pushed to make a statement about something, let that be a statement made by an attending. You know, uh, you're, you're welcome in any of these abusive head trauma cases to call me and I will, if I am in the country in town here, make every uh, you know effort to get to where you are and see the kid with you, and that way that you know decision 
can be on me and they can grumble at me because I don't care. Um, as long as we get the child taken care of and do the right thing for them. And, 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 and we have to, I think, have some perspective on, you know, other people's viewpoints on, on, on their care of the patient. Um, what other issues are there with these abusive head trauma things that have come up or caused concern in anybody's mind? I guess the, the one last thing I would say with that is please leave some wiggle room in your assessment for the attending to make a statement when they come back and look at the child with you, if that's what you're arranging, um, so that they can, and you can, you know, I would limit your description to there are hemorrhages present, you know, in this location and, you know, and, and Dr. So-and-so is going to come evaluate the patient and let that be our decision so that we don't appear to be at odds over our interpretation of things. Because that again is something that I have had to discuss personally in court and explain before a judge. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's discussable and I can certainly lay it out for them, but it'd be better if it looked, you know, if we tried to have a, a, a more a, a coordinated interpretation, as it were. Otherwise, I'm going to let you folks uh, get on with your day. If you need help finding that those chapters in that book, stop by clinic. Um, there should be one on the bookshelf right over where I sit, and I'll be happy to uh, share it with you. Um, I don't think that's available electronically. Are there other questions, concerns about things in general? A primary that I need to be aware of in terms of anybody getting access with all this COVID stuff going on? I guess it's a no. <laughs> I guess that's a no. Well, I'm sorry we didn't do this in person so I could bring you all bagels, but uh, uh, we'll do that at some point with a future lecture and we'll uh, um, uh, maybe be able to do this in person because I think that we, if we work it out right, we should be able to do this and spread out in the auditorium to the extent that we can do lectures and maintain social distance if that works for everybody. Something to think about. Anyway, thank you all. Thanks for getting me through uh, getting on Zoom and doing this because it definitely is not my forte. Um, and all of these um, things. And let's see, how do I, I guess I hit end show. There we go. Then I can get out of there. Um, so Catherine, I'll see you about nine, hopefully. And uh, everybody else have a wonderful day. And uh, um, we're out with the uh, five minutes to spare. Have a great day. See you. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. Yep. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Hoffman. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And it's night. For those of you I haven't met, stop by and say hi. Hi. <laughs>